everyone. Um, this is Magnus Granström, the director of, of SAFE, the Traffic and Vehicle Safety Center. And uh, I would like to welcome you all to this seminar that we will have jointly today with uh, the Cycling Research Center and, and SAFE. Uh, it's 9.30. We do see that quite a lot of people are still joining the meetings. So uh, we will give everyone maybe a, a, at least a few more seconds to um, to join up and um, I hope that everyone can both hear me clearly and also see the the screen in a good way. Okay so it's now uh, 9.31 I think we will get started so um, welcome uh, a few more people have, have joined in just uh, the last minute. So um, welcome, Magnus Granström, Director of SAFE. Um, and we are uh, joining up here today uh, because we see that there are so many things that we want to share when it comes to cycling, cycling safety and the development of, of uh, all kinds of issues related to, um, to cycling. We want to look into what kind of research um, is ongoing, what are the challenges that we have and so on. And we also see that, especially now in, in the times that we have in the last six, seven months, so much has been actually been happening also in, around the world and not least in, in our neighboring countries here in Europe, where in many major cities, uh, big decisions have been taken to uh, make sure that it's so much both easier and, and safer to, um, to go by bike and with the big changes that we have seen with the reduced um, uh, vehicle traffic and and so in the city centers. Um, also, the last just last week, last Friday, um, the um, uh, executive vice president of the U European Commission, Franz Timmermans, he um, shared some of his visions regarding shared mobility, uh, future mobility and so on, and, and with a special focus on cycling. And in that meeting, he also showed how this is uh, a very important sort of, uh, contributor to uh, to a more healthy and, and a greener future. And we also showed that there will be a number of initiatives. There is money available uh, within the uh, the um, oh, just lost the word. Uh, well. There will definitely be uh, money available uh, uh, for this kind of uh, of initiatives, and uh, what he wants to to see when it comes to um, finding these kinds of initiatives is that there should be clear goals from both uh, countries, cities, and, and uh, states, and so on. So um, I think it's important for us when we gather here in this setting with a number of, of uh, researchers, with a number of uh, people representing uh, cities, government and so on, that we, from a national perspective, we have to take part in this and we have to sort of really show that, okay, this is something that we want to do as well uh, in order to be able to, to participate in this. So um, that was uh, just a, an introduction and the aim is really that we we can discuss these things, we can uh, join up, we see where we have common needs, common uh, challenges, common targets and so on, that, that we can also find a good way of funding uh, future research. So um, when I say we, who are we then? Well, there are a number of people that you will listen to uh, during the day. Uh, there is uh, Magnus Larsson from Cycle Cycling Centre. Uh, Cycling Research Center, uh, Cycle Centrum, and myself. So it's Magnus and Magnus trying to uh, moderate uh, this uh, webinar that we have today. And we have um, four presenters who will give us different views, uh, show examples of ongoing research that is relevant to sort of uh, cycling in general, but very much also uh, how do we make sure that it's, uh, it's both uh, healthy and safe. So uh, we will have Katja Kirscher from VTI, we will have Marco Dotsa from, from Chalmers, uh, Helena Stigson from uh, Folksam um, and Fredrik uh, Bruselius. They will give us uh, these uh, reports on the on the different uh, research activities as examples of what is actually going on um, today. And then we have uh, two experts that we have asked to um, to join us today to comment on 
on the discussions and the, the presentations and so on. So uh, one of them is Johanna Smedberg, who is uh, the marketing manager at, at Cycle Europe. Hello, uh, everyone. I connect this meeting from Cycle Europe Bike Factory in Varberg. And very welcome, Johanna. And the other one uh, is uh, Peter Kronberg from uh, the Volvo Group, who is the safety director at the Volvo Group. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much, Magnus. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Very good. And then we know that uh, we can both uh, hear and see uh, the two of you. Um, I move on. Uh, so how do we do this in, in, in practice today? Um, we have a bit more than 100 people reg registered, so there will be quite a few of you. So it's important also that we, we, um, we have a dialogue. It's not only a matter of us presenting and, and, and the researcher presenting. It's, it's very much a matter of having uh, comments, uh, discussions, questions and so on. And we will do this in different ways. So there is a chat in the Teams uh, too. As uh, as uh, you all know, um, please use the, the chat. We will um, have people looking at the chat uh, continuously, making sure that we pick up what is uh, what is discussed there. And um, we do have quite limited time, so we will not be able to answer all questions probably, but we will save the chat. We will keep that and we will make sure that we can uh, keep a track of what has been discussed uh, and uh, questions that are raised in, in the chat. Uh, we are using the Menti tool, uh, menti.com, if you log into that on your phone or on your computer. Um, there will be uh, possibilities to, um, to respond to specific questions during, uh, during the meeting. I will show you and tell you when it's time to do that. And we will also have, have um, short discussions uh, after each of the presentations. So that is the, the way we we um, want to interact so please uh, be prepared with your comments questions uh, whatever it might be that you would like to um, to uh, to bring to today's uh, meeting so um, the agenda where are we what are we doing um, so uh, we are now in the introduction part uh, so it's myself and it's uh, Jonas Karlström who will also uh, describe a bit what the uh, Cycle Research Center is doing. We will then have um, the four presentations and discussions around the, the four presentation. And uh, since this is um, a two, hour, two and a half hour meeting, we, have, we will have a break uh, in the middle. So it's also up to us moderators to make sure that we keep track of time and uh, we will st uh, stick to the agenda and stick to the timing uh, so that we can uh, have the, the discussions that we want to have. So please, by that, I will hand over to, um, to Jonas and um, your view and your, your um, overview of what Cycle Centrum is doing. Thank you so much, Magnus. Uh, my name is Jonas Karlström. I am the deputy director of the Swedish Cycling Research Center at VTI. I'm going to give you just a short overview of what we do at the Cycling Center and also a short introduction of uh, our cooperation or collaboration with, with SAFER. So next slide, please. Uh, the, the Swedish Cycling Research Center was commissioned by the government to VTE in 2018. And it's a part of the national strategy for, for increased and safe cycling. And we have funding for this uh, research center until 2021. Uh, is there any problem with my sound? No? Uh, well, we have funding until 2021, uh, and by the looks of things, this will get prolonged until 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, within the Cycling Center, we have different functions. Uh, we have communications, which is uh, from our webpage, cyclecentrum.vti.se, uh, uh, and our newsletter. And at uh, our webpage, you will find information about guidelines and different research projects and other information, events and such. And if you want to have uh, uh, updates on this, you will you can just sign up for our newsletter uh, on the web page and it's like six or seven updates a year you will get from that. We also do arrange seminars, webinars and workshops like this one. 
we also arrange uh, projects of strategic importance, which is smaller projects in uh, fields that we think is important, but where it's hard to get funding externally at the moment. Uh, two of those is, for example, uh, logistics with bikes, uh, cargo bikes, and also cycling tourism. We also have a PhD student network uh, with 36 participants, all with cycling in common in their research from Lublin in the north to Lund in the south, and also participants from Don Denmark and Norway. Uh, we also do have cooperations with academy, national, regional, local authorities, and private sector and, and NGOs. And next slide, please. And one of those cooperations is uh, collaborations is with with Safer that we're launching today, and it's for increased safe cycling. And we want to do this by uh, sharing knowledge. Um, like publication and research. We want to arrange various knowledge building activities like this one. And we also want to think more broadly. And I just want to say welcome to this webinar that are, is arranged for, by us at Sickle Centrum together with, with SAFER. Thank you very much. And then uh, I will continue then and just give a, a brief overview of uh, what SAFER is for those of you who are not familiar with us. And uh, we um, act as a competence center for um, vehicle and traffic safety. We've been around almost 15 years uh, now, and uh, we have a collection of uh, 37 partners. So what we do is that we join up, uh, we work on uh, Sort of our, our real baseline is is uh, the vision zero, and we want to make sure that we we provide the knowledge that is needed, um, new research, and bring uh, PhD students and so on together, and make sure that we uh, we continually um, increase our knowledge, our understanding, and the needs that all the different actors in this um, in this field needs. So um, the vision for for us very much closely connected then to, um, to Vision Zero, of course, is that everyone should be able to travel safely from wherever you are to wherever you need to go. So that is uh, that is our baseline. And uh, uh, I said that we have today 37 partners. So this is the uh, the partner list. Uh, we'll not go through this in detail, but um, as you see, we have a collection then of uh, academic partners, research partners of different kinds, and a large number of, of industrial partners, and also a collection of partners representing the society. And, and we are always interested in, in extending this. And one of the things that we do, as Jonas was saying, we, we also do this through collaboration with various other centers. We don't have to do everything ourselves, of course. Uh, there are a lot of people who know um, a lot and uh, act in, in other uh, settings and so on. But I think it's important from a national perspective that we, we try to join up as much as possible and, and also share the resources and also, of course, find um, the funding that we uh, we need to to have in order to, uh, to provide this this knowledge. Uh, we have also so, uh, Umbrella. We do run some uh, some oops, some uh, pre studies. So right now we have a call open. So if there is anything else, oops, I think there is a problem with the presentation here. Um, if you have uh, uh, any questions regarding these um, pre studies, just uh, let us know afterwards. So that was the introduction part. Uh, I hand over then to um, to uh, Magnus. Please introduce Katja. Yes, I would like to introduce uh, Katja Kirche, who's going to talk about sharing different worlds and attention to perspective on different road user types. And Katja Kirche is a senior research, research leader in road user attention at VTI. Please have the floor, Katja. I wanted to talk about uh, something that I call sharing different worlds in connection to sharing um, the space. And it's a little bit of a pun, of course, because we're not sharing the same world, but we share sort of different worlds. And that is if we ju jump right in, um, there are two solutions basically for cyclists and motorized traffic. And one is mixed traffic and the other is sort of what we call separated infrastructure. But if we look at 
mixed traffic where cyclists and motorists sort of share the same road we can still wonder is the environment for both of them really the same and um, so now I'm taking examples from a study that we did with uh, people who drove and cycled the same route and if we look at that situation here we have the perspective of a driver and of a cyclist and the differences that we can see is that for example the the driver is a, a little bit different position than the cyclist Basically, in many cases, we can see that the infrastructure is more adapted to the motor uh, motorists' needs, and uh, we have different means of perception in the same situation in terms of, for example, how we can use hearing, proprioception, and other uh, sense uh, sensory information. And um, there are also a bit different demands. Uh, for example, that the cyclist also needs to keep um, the balance, especially in a situation like here, where you have to go slowly or even stop. If we then look at the separated traffic infrastructure, how we call it, we can see here on the left picture that, for example, for cyclists, um, in very many cases, uh, the yellow markings indicate where cyclists have to share the space with other non-motorized -motor uh, road users, like pedestrians and all other kinds of people. And then um, it's so often... That We'll come back to the work leaders to organize these interviews. Uh, next slide, uh, Anna-Marie. Somebody is uh, not muted. <laughs> So, yeah, and then uh, also uh, cyclists uh, um, and pedestrians often use both directions, so you have a lot more to take care of than a motorist who usually has a lane for him or herself. But then uh, we also have a lot of, um, of positions where we sort of, where we interact, where we meet motorists and non-motorized road users. Um, and that is often where in locations where the information density is already high. Um, and there are different demands on information sampling on different road user groups. The priority rules are um, a bit different and not always very logical, and that also means that the information intake requirements are not always very easy to um, to know for everybody. So we go into that a bit deeper, just to talk about the different worlds that we are in. So. Uh, if we look at the infrastructure, there's um, different ma maintenance for motorists and cyclists. Often it's a different surface quality. Even if we are on the same surface, uh, it can mean something totally different for a cyclist than for a car. I mean, cars usually don't fall over if there's a sharp edge or anything. But also if we have separated infrastructure, if we look at the picture and in, in the lower right-hand corner, you see that the surface of the cyclist is much less uh, plain and nice than compared to what the car driver surface is, and that is very often the case that it looks like that. Also, if we look at the straightness, I mean, how easy, uh, how logical is it that you can go from A to B without making a lot of curves and detours? Uh, so that also plays a role for the efficiency. Um, then also the forgivingness of the um, of the roadsides uh, is very different. Also, you let's see a lot of like concrete uh, placed in the middle of the cyclist tracks, often to prevent drivers from going there. But still, it's um, a risk for our cyclists. Then, of course, we have the mass and the normal speed of um, of the different roads, road user groups that is different between the two groups. And then there, also, if we look at the within group variation, I mean, cars basically make uh, people are rather similar. First of all, you need an education, but then also it doesn't matter how strong you are, you can go, go at the same speed uh, in a car an 80-year-old lady and if you're a 20-year-old man. So um, there we have, a, uh, and within cyclists, we have a lot uh, more variation. And that all that also sort of plays a role into how um, the requirements on attention are for the, for the different road user groups. And that also includes um, how our vision functions, the peripheral vision plays a role, our other senses, but also expectations, experience and understanding. Um, but and then how the environment um, accommodates our capabilities and limitations. So also, again, I just look at um, at a project that we did, uh, we see a, an intersection here, just picked one uh, to illustrate what we were doing. So uh, we were looking at the 
requirements on attention that we have in this infrastructure. And if we start on the left side with a car driver, if you come traveling in the direction of the arrow, um, first here you have to attend to the two lanes, make a lane choice, and that you do by basically just looking ahead and seeing those two lanes. Uh, they are really easily visible in the infrastructure. Then you proceed further and you have to make sure that nobody wants to cross the zebra crossings. That can also basically be done by looking more or less straight ahead because uh, we have seen that people uh, see pedestrians with their peripheral vision and then they might focus on them and check whether they are uh, about to cross or not. But uh, you don't have to turn your head a lot um, to check for these zebra crossings. If we then look on the right hand side of a cyclist comes on the separated cycle path here going in the same direction, also wanting to go straight on um, the cyclist. Well, that is not an, a, like a strict requirement, but it's very useful for the cyclist to check over the, um, like the left forward if there's a car driver. I don't know whether they see my mouse, but coming from uh, from the opposite side, wanting to turn left or also you, it's uh, very good to check over your right shoulder to see if a car driver wants to turn right here. But then uh, in addition, you, ha you have to check to the right because, um, and that is something that we found out by asking uh, the police, uh, transport stealers, and like the road, uh, I'm not sure, safety administration or what they call it, I'm not quite sure, uh, and several other instances to, to make sure, uh, to understand whether here the cyclist has right of way or the, the driver coming from the right is right of way. But it turned out that um, people rather wanted to say that it's the car that has the right of way. So here you have to check to the right. So if you look at the angle that a cyclist needs to scan compared to what a um, driver needs to do in the same situation when going straight on. It's rather different. Um, and we think that it plays a role uh, where these rules are um, explicit or implicit, whether you can see them straight from the environment or whether you have to sort of know about them, then how much space you have to check for um, the necessary information that you need, whether these are overlapping in space, so you need to do a lot at the same time, uh, and also the sampling directions, like if you have to sample just from one direction or several. And um, that, of course, depends on the infrastructure and the maneuver and the road user type. And this here is just an illustration, but we follow that illustration through a few slides now. So what we found, um, 23 people, both cycling and driving um, along this route, um, we counted how many of these requirements they fulfilled. And um, as they are the same people, it's not like um, they, as you can hear um, in certain circumstances that cyclists are uh, reckless or uh, whatever. It's the same people, so it's nothing to do with uh, their personality. But we found that um, as car drivers, um, everybody um, fulfilled the retention requirements, but as cyclists, um, a lot of people um, did not, for example, look over the shoulder or check for, to the right. So we see that it is apparently more difficult for uh, for cyclists uh, to um, understand and fulfill these requirements. And of course, the, the useful ones are not uh, really necessary, but they're sometimes good in order to survive. Um, then we also look, uh, we, we estimated the complexity of the situation based on a method that I don't want to go into detail here, but you can see the higher um, the mountain becomes, the, desto, uh, the, the more complex it the situation and uh, for cars here on more in, on the upper field on the left, you see that the complexity is sort of slowly increasing over time, whereas for cyclists, it's uh, rather flat, uh, rather non-complex and then increases rather sharply. So you have to be aware when that happens. Um, we also looked at the glance distribution for the two um, road user types, again, for the same people, and we see that Cyclists have to scan more to the left or do scan more to the left and the right. Don't uh, look uh, to the uh, forward area as much as the car drivers do. And also when we mm, estimated the content of what they did, um, cyclists while uh, looking to the front have a lot more of sort of default glances where nothing happens, whereas um, drivers have more traffic to monitor and so on. So there are differences and that depends on the situation, but that is only for this situation here. But generally we saw that um, 
the world is a bit more complicated for cyclists. So if we look uh, just briefly at where the relevant information is, if we now take a, a left turn for a car, we can, for example, see that um, the requirement on a driver is you have to pay attention to these three traffic streams when turning left. They are all uh, motorized vehicles, but also to these two cyclist uh, streams, come, well, four basically, because they are coming from both directions. Um, as a cyclist turning left, uh, you get in addition uh, a few more traffic streams that you need to pay attention to. And then if we look at the positioning of the different road users, we see that um, the uh, for the drivers, most of the action happens, uh, or of the interaction with motorized traffic happens sort of in the central field where you know here is where you do the, have to do the turn, whereas uh, cyclists are more um, located when you're still entering the intersection or when you're already leaving, and they also are more in the peripheral field, which is in terms of physiology, uh, makes them harder to to be seen. And um, to go further on that, I mean, um, visibility, uh, visibility, conspicuity and expectations, it's not like if even if you're lit and have a reflex vest and everything as a cyclist, that is, of course, very good, but it's not enough because the expectations uh, are at least as important. And is, if a driver doesn't look at you, you're not seen. So first you have to be expected usually in order to be seen because um, even if you're very conspicuous, if uh, there's this look but fail to see phenomenon, uh, you can be looked right through. Um, and there is uh, evidence for that, uh, scientific evidence from uh, mostly Finnish studies where it was found that in a right turn situation like this one, um, more cyclists um, were hit by cars that were turning right than by cars that were turning left. And that is because there was a left, less visual scanning to the right uh, for drivers who wanted to turn, to turn right because they only were looking at the car stream coming from the left that they were going to enter. So there's a lower chance for a cyclist um, coming from the right to be detected. Um, so uh, how to improve the situation? Of course, these are very general uh, suggestions here. Become aware of the issues, acknowledge the mis issues, study and understand the issues and develop possible solutions and act accordingly. But what I want to say is that um, we don't need only quick fixes here and there, but we need like a big master plan. And um, if cyclists are run over by drivers because the infrastructure uh, does not make it clear to drivers to monitor for cyclists from a certain direction. For example, it doesn't help to tell the cyclists to wear helmets or reflexes, but we need to improve the infrastructure so these things uh, don't even happen. And then we always have the combination of speed and mass that are crucial for the force of a collision. And then we have to think about where we want this speed and mass combination to be. I mean, is that appropriate in towns? Is it appropriate in, around schools? I mean, can we do uh, some reconstructions, can we do geofencing or whatever to, to sort of um, not get to a force that um, makes people die when they're hit. Um, and just, to, I know that time's basically up, but uh, I just wanted to mention a project that we um, are have just started with, and that is looking at children's active uh, travel. And there we are just looking at the, uh, at the attentional requirements on uh, that are put on children and how children of different ages can meet these requirements. And we hope that this can give some input on how we can build an environment that is safe for the user, which uh, and the users are also, of course, children. So that was only very briefly. And of course, you can ask questions about that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Katja. That was very interesting. And uh, I would like to have a comment from uh, Johanna. Thank you. Thank you, Katja, for sharing different worlds through your work and your findings. So yeah, we do know from different studies that with infrastructure that makes cyclists feel safe and secure, we can expect more people to cycle. And I think we all want to to accomplish that and, and, and uh, go in that direction. So reach, re research like this that highlights the drivers and the cyclist perspective and the interaction in between the two gives us this important input into discussions about future infrastructure investments that is needed. So the cyclist uh, 
is vulnerable in the traffic and it's important to understand what can be done to make it more safe to go by bike. So in your work, um, I think that you conclude that the expectations on the cyclist uh, needs to be better communicated more clearly. So a question to all of you is how can we understand this even better and take action on that? And uh, another reflection, in the end, you mentioned the children's perspective, and this is something that is important for us from the industry to understand as well. So this can give us new insights when we we might need to, to consider this into our product development in the future. So that's my, my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johanna. And uh, what, what do you think, Peter? Uh, Peter, has you, what is your reflections over Katya's research and presentation? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Katya. And um, it's uh, clearly very critical that we explore how to improve road user behavior and interaction between road users. Um, as you know, I represent uh, heavy vehicles in that industry and urban safety, vulnerable road users is uh, among our very much top priorities. It's a really uh, important challenge that we um, that we are facing and it's, it's um, uh, really important that we get a full understanding of not just um, the the challenges that we are facing but also how we can um, utilize that knowledge in a good way and um, Katya of course you you know we have been working also on other studies that you are you are conducting in um, how driver training for instance is um, contributing to to improving road safety and interaction between um, vehicles and um, and cyclists and I think that is a particular interesting for us uh, we have a, a, a great possibility in the commercial vehicle industry that we have drivers are in fact, uh, or commercial vehicle drivers need to undergo uh, 35 hours of training every five years uh, to keep uh, fresh and, and uh, up to date on everything and make sure that they have the competence and skills needed for their job. And this type of knowledge uh, is, I think, very, very important uh, to incorporate into that uh, training program. And um, ourselves at Volvo, we actually do, I think it's like 30,000 or so trainings every year. So it's it's an immense possibility. And, and um, we are already obviously uh, implementing a lot of that types of, of competence into, into the training. But uh, it's in, very important to be on, uh, at the very uh, state of the art of that uh, so that we can make the most out of out of that opportunity, um, and I think uh, you're 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 exploring an, an area where uh, we we need to go even deeper. I think it's um, the intentions uh, of of road users and how to understand that between uh, truck drivers, bus drivers, and and uh, cyclists. I think the intentions are as important as just the fact that you are detected. And we have many, uh, I think, interesting challenges facing us um, now more than ever, possibly with increasing cycling and the fact that we have e-bikes and, and electric scooters and so on. So uh, many drivers, I don't think, expect um, vulnerable road users to appear just as quickly as they in fact do. And I think that also some of the infrastructure is not designed for the speeds that we now have among cyclists. So that itself, I think, is a very interesting challenge. Uh, we have other challenges, actually, I think that is um, also inter interesting to to look into. If you consider the fact that um, I think cyclists are the only user group that are uh, that can stay on the right hand side of a lane and, and go straight ahead uh, while there is a vehicle to the left, which has uh, a right to turn uh, or is allowed to turn right just in front of the cyclists. That's a recipe for 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 a big problem, I think. And uh, Anticipation becomes important here as well, I think, we, just with the, if you consider heavy vehicles and trucks, which actually might, may indicate going straight or even slightly turning left uh, in order to create that space that the vehicle needs in order to turn right, which if there is an, a misunderstanding among uh, at the, on the cyclist part uh, could result in a crash and, uh, or a collision. That would be devastating, of course. So uh, yeah, your work is really important, Katya. And, um, I think uh, you have a lot to uh, explore uh, on top of what you've already done. Back to you, Magnus. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, I would like to reflect and start to invite all the audience. Uh, please write your questions in the in the in the chat and to Katya and to the uh, expert commentators. Uh, sharing the road. This is the issue, and I think it's more uh, now we have to see it in, in a different way than we have done before. So I would like to, uh, in that way, give you Katya a chance to reply a little bit of what Johanna and Peter said by introducing the question from Anna. The infrastructure design looks different in different countries. For example, any comments on the importance for distraction and interaction? Cycle lands compared to separate cycle paths, for example. Katya, can you develop yeah. that? Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, I think it's not only in different countries, but even within one country, the cycling infrastructure can look very differently uh, from place to place. It can either be there or not, or um, have priority or not. And um, it's not always easy to understand which rules apply. For example, uh, the, the, what I had in my presentation, that um, even though the signs look like uh, traffic from the right has to yield, um, it actually only has to yield to the car traffic in Sweden, but that is not the same necessarily in other countries. And um, so, um, yeah, I think there's definitely potential, and I wouldn't even necessarily say it's uh, so much distraction, which is the main problem, but it's rather um, uh, understanding what you have to expect. And um, so I think the, the infrastructure really needs to communicate um, what uh, the rules are and how people have to behave. And I am personally, I'm skeptical uh, to um, infrastructure that sort of doesn't really tell you how to behave, because I think in the end, it's mostly the, the strongest who will um, sort of take uh, his or her right to, to continue. So I think uh, if you know uh, how uh, which rules apply, then it's often easier um, to adhere to them. And then, of course, given the situation that we all talk about uh, increased and safer cycling and so on. I also think that we have to rethink the the role of the cyclist as a road user and we need to um, um, make the cyclist at least um, a part to, to motorize traffic in terms of uh, uh, the, the possibility to make uh, to let a cyclist travel efficiently. So we should um, give the cyclist a lift in terms of um, it's the status of, of cycling. So, yeah, a long reply. But that's no, it's a good, a good reply. I think you're you're into something because this, this, uh, the conversation climate and, of, of course, is changing now. And I think that, that what you're looking into now is that we before looked in, into the matter of who has the right, which is good to know. But also, uh, I, mean, I mean, we have to, we have to, to, to be equal. So we, when we're sharing the road, we are two road users, not one stronger or more important than the other one. So I think that's a thing that has to be discussed among uh, the authorities. And I think that you, you you were into that issue. Maybe you want to add some more information in, in your thoughts about the roles for road users. Yeah, well, um, I, it's uh, without trying to sound uh, like a car hater, I think it's very much about uh, respect and it's um it's easy to say well it's about distraction of cyclists get passed really closely for example in uh, in rural uh, environments but i mean as soon as you show that you actually do um sort of uh, drive around the cyclist a little bit uh, you uh, you sort of show that you've seen the cyclist otherwise you would cr uh, crash right into the person but uh, in terms of respect i mean you need to give the cyclist space because uh, the cyclist is um, well needs the space due to the wind draft because uh, and due to other reasons it's just uh, scary to be passed very closely so it's sort of like uh, accepting that cyclists are people with, and research has shown that uh, not all car drivers uh, see cyclists actually as people um, so um, we need to have respect for each other we need to respect that there are different needs and um, well again i think we need to um, make cycling um, 
uh, something that has status, that is a legitimate um, mode of transportation, and it's not only about wanting to get out uh, to get some fresh air and some exercise, but it is an efficient uh, means of transportation to get somewhere, and that is something that needs to be incorporated both in the infrastructure and in the regulations and yeah, and many other things as well, just in the society as a whole. Thank you, Katya. I, I do agree, and I think the audience uh, maybe have comments, but we, we're soon going over. And I, I want to just say the things that change, uh, for example, I, I, back in the 90s, we said that children shouldn't cycle until they were 12 years old. And it was only a safety focus, uh, according to psychology. And today we maybe have another view. I hope we have another view that where we look into that these children actually need the exercise and we may not maybe we should uh, transform the environment around them and as another example the traffic environment and as, an, as another example we should also uh, make the infrastructure as you were in, into in your presentation make it work together because if, if uh, i as a cyclist drive as fast as the car that that gives another signal a, a, an uphill i maybe go very slow then I need a separate bike lane to go slow and not interrupt the cars. But when I go downhill in the city, that's, I mean, it, it has to be, uh, we have to look into how the infrastructure can support sharing the road in a good way. Thank you, Katja. Over Thank to you. Magnus. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, and uh, I would uh, then like to, to give a very warm welcome to uh, Marco Dotza, uh, Professor Marco Dotza, um, who comes from uh, Chalmers and uh, he's heading the, the group working on uh, crash analysis and prevention. So, uh, Marco, I will stop my sharing here and I hope that uh, your um, presentation will come up. Yes, uh, so uh, thank you, Magnus, for the introduction. Uh, can you see my slides? Absolutely. Great, so that is a good start. Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sickle Centrum and SAFER for organizing this event. I know a lot of people are listening to me. Of course, I missed not seeing you, but uh, it's great to be so many uh, people here uh, that cares about uh, cycling safety. Uh, I would also, I own uh, everybody an apology because you saw I just pop in and I will also rush out. And unfortunately, I have another meeting that overlaps this one and I need to prioritize the other meeting, not because it's more important or more interesting, but uh, I, uh, I, I, my presence is mandatory there. So having said so, I'm happy to present uh, uh, one project here that is called MICA. MICA stays for modeling interaction between cyclists and uh, uh, automobiles was founded uh, uh, within the FF5 framework and uh, the main two actors there were Shalmesh and Vionir. But to tell the truth, we were a little bit helped, uh, actually quite much from Toyota, because thanks to Toyota we could afford the data collection that was outside the budget for uh, this project alone. And in a moment you will see that. Our project is uh, uh, concerned with uh, Okay, I hope you can see the slide and now you can see a video. Can you please confirm? Yes. 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 So our project is concerned with overtaking and um, overtakings are actually not so common as a crash scenario for cyclists. Uh, but what happens is that if something goes wrong during an overtaking, uh, things uh, can become pretty severe. And it's very easy for you to imagine that there are a lot of things that can go wrong starting from uh, this truck not seeing the cyclist and maybe rear-ending the cyclist, or uh, uh, the truck uh, having some uh, uh, conflict with the uh, oncoming traffic, and maybe not leaving too much uh, uh, space uh, uh, to the cyclist as it overtakes it. And finally, also in the last phase, uh, when the truck uh, may cut in in front of the cyclist. So there are a lot of things that can go wrong and we focused on the first phase of an overtaking, so the approaching phase. And in the approaching phase, you can see that we have a, a truck in this video, but of course it could be a car, 
uh, that uh, approaches the cyclist from behind. And what we wanted to do in Mika is to come up with some uh, smart ideas to improve uh, a current active safety system like front collision warning and automated braking assistance that uh, may help avoiding this kind of collisions. So the whole new idea about Mika, everything revolved about uh, uh, a driver model. A driver model that was able by getting some information from the environment and specifically how distant you are from the cyclist and from the oncoming traffic, and as well as what we call the bicyclist overlap, which is pretty much uh, where is the uh, cyclist in the lane? Is it in the middle of the lane? Is it on the side? This driver model merges this information and make an estimation about the probability that the driver will brake or steer, because those are the typical maneuver that a, a, a attentive driver would do to initiate an overtaking maneuver or to slow down and wait a little bit. Uh, Alexandre Rush was a PhD student that took care of this driver model. Then uh, the output of this driver model were used by Pratik Talia, another PhD student. And what Pratik did is uh, he looked uh, at the probability of driving, uh, of uh, braking or steering as you're approaching a cyclist and compared uh, this probability with uh, what the driver was actually doing in the vehicle. So he made a system that instead of acting on kinematics, if you have a front collision warning or an automated braking uh, system, what you do typically is look at kinematics, how close you are to the vehicle in front of you, uh, time to collision. But here the approach is different. What Pratik does is he looks at kinematic, but he also looks at the mismatch between what the driver should do from the, uh, Alex model and what the driver actually does, which is something you get from the CAM signal in the, in the car, because if a driver is steering or braking, the car knows. Then he generates a new uh, kind of front collision warning that we believe is particularly acceptable. Acceptable because uh, it may, uh, it should happen every time you are outside what we call comfort door. Why should be so? Well, because uh, if uh, uh, the, most of the drivers uh, would have started braking or steering by the time we give the braking and uh, the, the warning, then uh, there must be something wrong in that case, uh, something unusual, maybe destruction that motivate why that specific driver is not acting and uh, make our um, warning uh, reasonable. We weren't happy to come to this point in the project, we also had a third PhD student, Jordanka Kovaceva, and what she did was to actually compare a, a, this system, this new a system with the idea of the mismatch with the, or some traditional systems and verify the safety benefit. So the data that we use to uh, generate the model looks uh, like this. This is data collected thanks also to Toyota and Autolive in Vorgorda, we are on an airfield, of course, because of safety. And for the same reason, you're going to see two robots now, because uh, we couldn't expose a real cyclist to this uh, uh, scenario, and uh, we couldn't use a real oncoming traffic, because, of course, if we would crash uh, with the known balloon car, the consequence would not be acceptable. So what happened here is that you saw just one single trial, but we did several trials with several uh, drivers in several configurations. That means uh, different speeds, different position of the bike, different timing to the oncoming vehicle. Now, once we had all this data together, what Alex did is he started to look at his driver model. And what is interesting here to understand is that there are two strategies when you overtake, overtake a cyclist. Actually, there are two strategies when you overtake another road user. You may want to um, approach the road user and just to make a smooth maneuver around the cyclist. That's called a flying overtaking maneuver. Sometimes this is not possible. Why is it not possible? Because there is an oncoming traffic and this would not be a safe maneuver. So what you do, you approach the cycling as, and you slow down. You wait for the oncoming traffic to pass and then you complete the maneuver. So there are two uh, different strategies that correspond to two different actions. In an accelerative maneuver, you brake 
because you need to let the oncoming traffic pass. In a flying maneuver, you instead start to steer because you want to circumvent the cyclist. So Alex model does this. Uh, it looks uh, as uh, at the time as you approach the, uh, the cyclist, so you would approach the cyclist here, and uh, uh, about 200 meters before you approach the cyclist, you see that Alex has no idea if you are going to break, which is, would be the red line, or steer, which would be the blue line. But as you get closer to the cyclist, you can see that in this case, Alex can predict, OK, this is a driver that uh, should break. And now what you can do is uh, you can verify inside the vehicle whether the driver is actually braking or not. And if the driver is not braking, that is an indication that something is wrong. It could be distraction. The driver hasn't seen the, the cyclist or it could be something else. Anyway, something abnormal that we can use to trigger a warning. Uh, of course, this model is much more complicated than I can explain here. And if you are curious, there are a few publications that you can refer to. But now we have a driver model. Now the next step is how do we integrate this driver model into a vehicle so that the vehicle becomes smarter and can help the driver avoid the crash. And this is what we did. So up here is still uh, Alex driver model. Now Pratik is uh, creating an algorithm that compares the driver model output, so the probability of braking or steering, with what the driver actually is doing. And you read it from the brake pedal and from the uh, steering wheel. And then uh, uh, he makes this intent-based frontal collision warning or automated emergency braking. Why we call it that way? Well, we call it that way because uh, our trigger is not mainly kinematics uh, as it is today, but it's based on the intent of the driver to either steer or brake. And of course, um, what we get out of this, and again, this is more complicated than this, and you can read more papers, but what we get out of this is different intervention times. And typically, if you compare the new frontal collision warning that we generated, created in Mika, with the previous one, what you find is that we anticipate the uh, warning quite much, which gives much more time to the driver to solve the, uh, the collision. Now, some of you may think, OK, this is a great idea, early warning, but some of you maybe have been around a little bit longer and start to say, ah, ah, Marco, you can't warn drivers too early because if you do so, they're going to get upset. How can you be sure that uh, they weren't going to break or steer eventually? Uh, we are not sure. Well, I take the point, but the reason why we think that in this specific case, uh, an early warning is legitimate is that we don't, uh, don't make all the warning earlier. We in generally, uh, generally anticipate the warnings because we react on this mismatch with, between what a normal driver would do and what the actual driver is actually doing. So in that case, we believe we are outside what is the comfort zone for the driver and therefore an early warning is pretty much not cheating. Uh, now, the real question is, uh, but does this work in uh, real uh, traffic? Well, of course, to test that, uh, you would need to implement this system in some kind of ECU, mass produce it, get uh, thousands of vehicles around, and then wait uh, about 10 years uh, before the accident database can tell you the answer. Uh, we didn't have time to do that, so we did uh, some simulation with all the limitations of the case. So what we did is uh, we took a data from U-Drive. U-Drive is a uh, data from uh, the largest naturalistic driving study in Europe, where data was collected in several countries, including France, Poland, Holland, UK, and so on. And then here it was Jordanka that uh, uh, could run this uh, uh, algorithm from Pratik and a standard algorithm from Euro and Cup and compare the uh, effect of two frontal collision warning in selected events on real traffic data. So we found overtakings in the naturalistic driving data. Of course, we took away the maneuver of the driver because we didn't have crashes. By taking away the maneuver of the driver, either braking or steering, we created new crashes and then we uh, 
uh, run some simulation where the question what, was, what if uh, this driver would have had uh, this frontal collision warning, the old one or the new one? Would the driver have been able to uh, avoid the crash? And uh, what we could find is, uh, and uh, this is what uh, is shown in the figure, is that actually we can have a quite uh, um, big safety benefit where we can avoid several collisions and we can decrease speed in the remaining collision. And of course, uh, having a collision at low speed, a lower speed is always better. Even if in this case, or in this case with cyclists, a collision with the, between a, a motorized vehicle and the cyclist will never be a good idea, even at low speed. Now, the next step is uh, how can we be sure and uh, uh, that a driver would react in this way in real traffic? And uh, we can't because drivers are all different, no? Uh, not only they are intoxicated and maybe drowsy or uh, distracted, but they are all different in the way that they have different reaction time that may depend on age, that may depend on different uh, uh, subjective differences. So what we did actually is we compared the reaction to the warning to make sure that we were not misleading our results. So what you see in this figure are different uh, um, percentage of crashes avoided depending on different reaction models. A reaction model in this case is something that takes into account that the driver receiving a warning will need a little bit of time to start to react and then may react more or less uh, strongly, typically by braking harder or less hard. So what we did here is we have a comfort brake. So for different configuration for a braking that is relatively mild and for configuration for a braking that is much harsher. Now for each, uh, we also took into account uh, the reaction time and reaction time may change uh, quite much depending on many factors. So what you see, for instance, are these two uh, gray uh, columns, where fundamentally you see that uh, uh, in that case, there is no difference between the traditional front collision warning and the new one we are uh, presenting. And what's the reason? Well, the reason is that there we got the super driver, a driver that was able to react very, very fast and uh, break very, very hard. And of course, uh, this is what you would expect. No? As a driver becomes super performant, then the time of the warning will not impact so much uh, the outcome of uh, uh, the, uh, the event. So this was uh, Mika 1 in a nutshell, no? But now we need to go to Mika 2 because Mika 1 is over. And uh, the, the way I would like to do that is I would like to tell you what we learned from Mika 1, because what we learned from Mika 1 are pretty much the requirements for Mika 2. What we learned from Mika 1 that, well, we knew it already, is that uh, there are a lot of things that change how driver overtake a cyclist. There are infrastructure, uh, it depends on personal traits. Females overtake different than males. However, the most important factor is the presence of the oncoming traffic. As soon as you have oncoming traffic in the right place, then the way the driver circumvented the cyclist totally changed. We also realized that when you reach the, the cyclist from behind, and uh, maybe that's not the riskiest phase in an overtaking. So this is just part of the work. There are other phases as you go around the cyclist that are equally important. What also happens is that uh, if you approach a cyclist from behind and your intention is to steer, by the time we know that you are not steering, it's pretty late because you can steer very close to the cyclist and still uh, avoid it. So what happens is in a situation where there is no oncoming traffic and steering away is an option, if we only have AB as a solution, we will activate AB very late. So this is a, a situation where automated emergency steering would be a much better idea. We also realized that there are some crashes that are too critical. We may not be able to avoid them and the passive safety system should then come into play 
uh, because the, the whole problem cannot be solved in all situations by active safety. Uh, we also realize that if we want to understand and improve our models, we need more data. And I'm sure you heard it from all the uh, um, researchers like me. We always want more data. And the reason why we want more data is uh, that uh, we need more critical situation. And to have more critical situation, we need to have new methodology. And new methodology in this case uh, are that I would like to be on the test track and have a very, very short time to collision. And to do that in a safe way, I cannot have a robot. I cannot have a human, I cannot have a robot. I need uh, um, some virtual targets. So we are looking into augmented and virtual reality that uh, we can use uh, on, the, uh, the, on the test track so that we can th do things more critical. Uh, of course, it would be nice to have more naturalistic data. And of course, it would be nice to double check that in the effort to give this earlier warning, we don't introduce too many false positives. No, false positive will be a situation where we give a warning and it's not needed. Then if you look at uh, what we are doing uh, from a, a, an, out, a, an automated vehicle perspective, our models are actually telling a automated, uh, automated vehicle how to overtake a cyclist. And that could be very interesting, but again, we need to nail down what is the relation with oncoming traffic. The very last point is uh, uh, that as things become more critical, and fundamentally, if you move away from the approaching phase, the other phases are more critical, then uh, you are really driving up all the requirements for uh, wireless communication sensor technology to make sure that we can use this, the driver models. This is my last slide to tell you what is Mika 2 about, but I already told you. Well, we, <laughs> we kept the same, the same PhD students because they did a good job. Uh, we have more partners because we create more competence. Uh, we are addressing all the phases of the overtaking maneuver. And we are also looking at uh, uh, crash causation in the different phases to motivate uh, the investment for different systems. And uh, we are looking both uh, at braking and uh, steering systems, also uh, automated emergency steering. And uh, we are looking at the uh, passive safety system. So fundamentally, in this slide, you see uh, what are the phases, what are the possible risks, and the different system that we are addressing. And uh, we are focused on new methodology like augmented reality. And we will use uh, uh, the bike simulator at VTI and also a robot bike that is developed at Chalmesh. And then we have new data, new data from naturalist from Miscando and also new data from IF that will contribute with insurance data. That was it. I hope uh, I didn't extend too much my time. And uh, if you are more curious, these are some uh, uh, publications. Thank you very, very much, very Marco. Much, Marco. And, and I will. Uh, then uh, uh, hand over hand directly, directly to, uh, to uh, Peter. Peter. Well, um, I'll do my best if I can make myself clear. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, well, I've been uh, uh, enjoying uh, being part of, of your projects now for, for some time, and uh, I know the excellent research that you have been doing. Uh, I think it's 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 very excellent, and um, the um, the scenario looking into is a known and serious uh, crash scenario for, for also for heavy vehicles, as you know. It's um, if you consider the uh, crashes that we are we have involving uh, heavy vehicles in Europe, a third of them are uh, related to unprotected road users, and um, I think it's about, according to our own research, at least 15% uh, or so is associated with this uh, particular scenario. It varies a lot, uh, of course, uh, depending on where in Europe you're looking, but on average around that. Uh, so it's very, very interesting uh, to look into the details on how you can model that. And um, your your results clearly show that there is a lot that can be done in uh, designing our warning strategies for uh, for the active safety systems that we are using and, and potentially also to optimize the performance of those emergency braking systems that will become so important now going forward. Um, I'm curious, uh, and, and if, if there is time to, to go into that, but I'm curious to see how your model is, um, would be trans heavy vehicles, trucks and buses, different in terms of dynamics in, in, in uh, or, or strategies at least in, in when you decide to do the overtaking or not. 
with that said, I mean, if if the the model is very accurate in also suppressing unnecessary uh, warnings, uh, I think that would be extremely uh, of interest to us. Uh, acceptance and and uh, accuracy of the systems are extremely important in in getting the most out of that type of system. So um, yeah, I think that would be very very interesting to to have. Um, you did, I believe, look into quite a bit also around the warning strategies and the forward collision warning systems that you talked about. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if I um, got it, how much you actually looked into predicting the failure to detect as well as uh, uh, the strategy. Obviously, if, if we are able to to very clearly detect the, the difference between an imminent breaking, let's say, or a late breaking and a failure to, to actually do that, that would be extremely useful for us, for sure. And I also had another question actually for you, and that was if you looked at uh, how the overtaking maneuvers change with the speed of the cyclists. Uh, if you look at that particular scenario I talked about in, in accident research, 15% uh, or so, actually quite a lot of that is motorized two-wheelers, so motorcycles and, and mopeds and so on. And they are, of course, quicker and no normally. And I would be curious to understand how much you think is possible to model uh, the, how that the strategy of overtaking changes with the speed of the cyclist or the uh, two-wheeler. That would be quite interesting. Uh, maybe a future research in Mika 2 or, or even Mika 3. And uh, for Mika 3, I would also uh, would be very curious to see if you would be uh, able to model other scenarios like uh, intersections and, and um, crossings and so on. But uh, I mean, very great work that uh, your team has been doing, Marco. Okay, if I have very shortly, heavy vehicle are this model transferable while well, the framework? Yes, with heavy vehicles, you have this um, uh, all the forces, the kind of side wind that you get from uh, uh, the truck as it goes uh, around you. And that would be a critical part to add uh, that with cars is not as important. Uh, when it comes to the speed of the cyclist, uh, no, we didn't change much the speed of the cyclist. We took 25 kilometers per hour because that is a, a normal e-bike. Uh, I think that as long as you have 70 kilometers per hour on the car and something in the range of 20 or a normal bike, that doesn't make a big difference. For a motorcycle, of course, it will be different because it, it creates a longer time for the overtaking maneuver. So of course, then it will it will be much more important that the driver can estimate the speed of the motorcycle than the driver estimating the speed of the bike. I do not know how much time we have, and I no, tend to talk too much. So I'm trying to. No, I think we need to we need to continue. So please, uh, Johanna, your reflections and comments. Yes, I promise to make it a little bit shorter than I think we are heading for a break soon. But uh, just a few comments and thank you, Marco, for sharing your work. Uh, it's really impressing how to see the cars are getting smarter and smarter. Unfortunately, the bike industry is way behind. And I like to comment that a little bit because although e-bike means a new dimension of mobility, electrical power, new technology and connectivity is making the bikes, the bicyclists and our bike business smarter. It takes time and there is a lack of knowledge within our business when it comes to IoT, software development, ITS, etc, etc. And I think that a technology transfer from other transport sectors would help us to move faster and to interact with other vehicles in the safest way. So how can we make this a reality? Um, can we do some project out of that? And and the other reflections is, um, as you mentioned, the speed of the cyclist. Uh, I think it's just important not to see the cyclist as a homogene group. I mean, there are many different types of cyclists behaving differently. Even if the speed is the same, they might behave differently when a vehicle is approaching them. One is an experienced one, the other one is maybe a beginner. So I think it's it's important to consider as well some, somehow. 
So that's my comment to your work. Thank you. If I can say two words, in my work, I feel I'm addressing half of the problem all the time because uh, uh, we work with the OEMs, we work with uh, uh, in the ecosystem and we look at everything from the driver. And I'm sure we are neglecting a very important part, which would be to look at the same problem from the cyclist side. And that would be great to do with a company like yours that may be more uh, uh, favorable to look at the problem from the different perspective. Then what you say about the variety of cyclists is absolutely true. Uh, drivers are very uh, different, uh, but at least uh, they should be at least 18 and maybe not, uh, not too old either. And uh, uh, they went all through some training. Uh, cyclists can be anyone, can be a kid, can be an elderly person, can be a person that never uh, experienced the traffic in Sweden and just came to this country for the first time. So indeed, uh, the variability of behavior there is much larger, which creates a lot of extra challenges. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, Johanna and, and Peter also for the reflections and comments. And there are, there are some uh, discussions also ongoing in, in, the, um, in the chat. And some of them you have touched upon were sort of related to this sort of diversity between different types of cyclists and also how you, um, how you experience an overtaking, which could also be very, very different from, from person to person. What do you feel as a sort of a safe overtaking when you are on a bike? I think that that differs quite a lot, but I see that Katja has also commented a bit on that. So I think we will we will uh, leave those there. And um, as um, time flies, uh, I would like to move uh, if I can find my pointer. Uh, I'd like to move to uh, very very quickly towards our break. And uh, now you have a chance. So please uh, bring up your. Um, phone or you can do it on the computer as well so menti.com and you use the code that's on the on the screen and uh, we will now leave this open so just please write uh, your comments and reflections okay everybody it's now uh, 10 55 so uh, we will uh, start up the meeting again i uh, hope you've had a chance to bring your tea or coffee or water or whatever or a fruit or whatever you like to to um to have um, and as you can see on the screen i hope that you will see the, the scrolling of uh, the mentor responses uh, we will keep this open for uh, for a while um, and then we will collect this input in the in the core team here afterwards and see what, what are the things that we will continue to address. And um, having read some of them, some of them, I see that uh, we uh, we have come at, covered some of the questions uh, and so on, but uh, there are a lot of things being being written as well. I think I see that the, uh, the infrastructure is coming up several times, so that is something we will we will uh, dig into. Um, so, as I said, this is uh, the, the Menti page is open. Uh, so please continue to um, to write. Uh, then I will move this one away from the from the shared screen if I manage to do that. Uh, we will continue uh, with our presentations. Now, please, uh, Helena from Folksam, you're an associate professor, and you have been looking into um, ways to protect people. And um, please, uh, I will stop my sharing and then we will hand over the screen to you. Thank you. So I hope you see my screen right now. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So this is actually um, a pre-study that we are conducted at SAFER. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a bit more about the background, why we ended up to have a pre-study. So it's a lot of um, how can we increase the visibility uh, so you can avoid a crash, but also if a crash occurs, uh, can we then reduce injuries by smart clothes and materials. So uh, we have went through fatal crashes and um, when we went through the ones that occurred on rural roads, we could see that most of them occurred when a cyclist was cycling along uh, the road 
uh, hit by a um, passenger car uh, from the rear. And uh, we also saw that most of this, um, the driver uh, claimed that they didn't see uh, the cyclist, even though it was uh, daylight. So, uh, of course, most of these would uh, either, either could be prevented by infrastructure changes, but also future uh, vehicle technology or vehicle technology that are actually on the market today. Uh, but when we were doing a forecast, we could see that uh, the maximum effect would be 49% of all the, uh, the crashes on uh, rural roads, but the maximum effect would be uh, expected uh, year 2050. And the majority of the fatalities would uh, still remain in 2030. So, of course, it's important to speed up uh, the implementation of uh, important uh, vehicle technologies uh, and uh, infrastructure changes. But um, if we can't do that right now, can we do something uh, before that uh, starting to happen and starting to affect the, uh, the fatal crashes? So then we are ending up uh, to just see um, the distribution of uh, the fatal crashes. And we can see that most of them are hit by a passenger car and also, as I said, uh, most of them on uh, rural roads are uh, hit when they are cycling along the road if, or if they are trying to mm, um, turning left when they are uh, having a vehicle approaching them from, uh, from the rear. Uh, so also that we saw that most of them occurred during daylight and few both cyclists and drivers were under influence of alcohol or drugs. And of course, in most of the cases, uh, the cyclist was uh, uh, not wearing a helmet. And we can see that uh, 46 of uh, these could be uh, uh, saved by using a helmet. But um, uh, we can also see that um, when we are looking into uh, crashes that uh, occurred when the cyclists were injured, most of these uh, have similar um, characteristics. And uh, also the majority were struck on uh, a carriageway, often uh, 70 kilometers per hour road. And this is just uh, um, uh, to the right, you can see a, a commercial from Kraft um, doing uh, clothing for cyclists. And as you can see, the cyclist is really dark dot on on the road and of course you can do something with the uh, to highlight the cyclist and i saw that we got a, a poll uh, from uh, Skövde högskola at um, is connected to to this meeting so uh, and he has been studying uh, for example b motions and uh, by highlighting moving parts uh, with different uh, colors or uh, uh, reflective uh, uh, materials, um, both the prediction of the cyclist's intention and also the possibility to detect uh, will increase. And uh, by motion will actually increase uh, the cyclist's likelihood of being seen up to 88%. Uh, so of course you can do something in, in this uh, figure to the, uh, to the right, you see uh, also during a sunny day it actually uh, highlights the cyclist a bit more. So, um, cyclist is, uh, cycling as um, uh, a training form is uh, very, um, uh, is increasing a lot. And in Sweden, we got like 400,000 people that are actually cycling uh, for doing uh, the exercise. And uh, many of these are connected to a uh, bike club. And that means that uh, we can actually influence uh, if we are doing smart clothing, then we can actually uh, affect uh, how they are looking. And perhaps you can use this to, to also set the trend for the everyday um, uh, cycling back and forwards to, to the office. Uh, so that's something that we are hoping to do. Um, so that is actually uh, one of the, our 
research questions. How can we increase the ability of a driver to detect the cyclist in daylight con uh, con conditions and thereby reduce uh, the seriousness uh, of injuries in case of a crash? And then if we are looking into if a crash occur, um, as you know, I'm based at the insurance company Folksam and uh, we are following the injuries that are leading to long-term consequences. And of these, 50% uh, are upper extremity injuries. And the most common injury is a uh, uh, collar bone fracture. Uh, and of course you can uh, fix this, but uh, these are leading to, because uh, the shoulder is such a complex uh, um, joint that will cause long-term consequences uh, because it's only connected to the rest of the body with uh, the collarbone. So uh, then we uh, did a study a couple of years ago. Uh, we were asking people that were um, at a Umeå University Hospital. Uh, they had a shoulder injury. How uh, the crash occurred? Uh, to try to identify injury mechanism. And we could see that 90% uh, uh, was a result from a fall onto the shoulder or a direct hit on uh, the collarbone. Uh, and uh, 8 out of 10 reported that they were falling sideways. And then we were starting thinking, could we, we actually add some shoulder pads to reduce the impact uh, force and thereby reduce the injury risk? So then we are ending up to our second uh, research question. What are the requirements on shoulder protection system against injuries to make uh, it both uh, protective and acceptable? So we have also done uh, back in the days uh, some studies at Folksam uh, together with uh, the KTH just to see um, if we are adding some shoulder pads um, what will happen in uh, in the collarbone and we could see that uh, the strain was uh, reduced and then we just uh, did some uh, crash test at uh, Autoliv uh, to using uh, the side uh, word seed uh, crash test dummy to measure um, uh, what happens in in the shoulder and then we compare the one without with the uh, one with the uh, um, jacket from uh, POC that is adding uh, some shoulder padding uh, and it's uh, for downhill uh, biking and we couldn't even see such a big difference between with and without and then we just um, did a prototype airbag uh, solution and as you can see uh, it was during the time when we were doing uh, helmet testing so it's actually an inflate, inflated uh, uh, hooding that we just used as a prototype to see if we could uh, reduce um, the force in in the shoulder area and uh, and then we could actually see that uh, the rib force was uh, reduced and also the displacement so this is uh, just to highlight that it is possible to do something. And then we are ending up to the pre-study that we are doing right now. Uh, we have uh, partners from uh, uh, Cykelcentrum VTI, Chalmers University of Borås and uh, University of uh, Gothenburg. And uh, we have experts on different areas um, to actually look uh, for the injury mechanism and uh, also um, smart uh, textile and uh, materials and uh, we are hoping to identify modern technology to uh, to actually um, both using them to detect the cyclist uh, during daylight condition but also reduce the injury risk if a crash occur. So we are hoping to have some results uh, um, in like uh, June next year and we are uh, more than happy to hear some um, uh, some input from you and of course I will be more than happy to answer some questions from you. Thank you very much Elena and, and thank you for uh, using this as a commercial for the pre-study. 
program that we have um, here as well. I think it's a, it's a good example of where you join up with um, also with some partners that maybe have not worked together so much before. So just to get new settings um, up and running and, and then you can hopefully take a step to a larger project uh, in the next uh, step. Uh, OK, so um, I'm taking back control of the presentation. So uh, Johanna, please bring your comments and thoughts um, on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Helena, for sharing your uh, work. Uh, at first, just a comment. I mean, to avoid accidents and injuries in the first place, I just want to stress what was discussed before that the investments in a safer traffic environment and the maintenance are needed. And, and I think as you comment in the beginning, uh, Magnus, we, we have a possibility now where the, ref, the recovery funds addressed by, by Franz Timmermans last week that could make it possible for us to, to, to speed up uh, this work with, with the investing in better infrastructure for the bicyclists as well. But to comment on your work, uh, Helena, I think that these kinds of solutions that can protect the cyclists from getting injured are very important, of course, as well. And, and uh, you are uh, presenting some really interesting solutions that can make difference, I think. But I think also when, when there are new research and innovations presented like this, uh, there is important to invest in good information and communication as well. Because people need to be aware of the benefits uh, using the innovations and to change their behavior and be prepared also to to invest in the new product. So it's something that we should think of how can we do that in in the best way to help you. Yeah, That's of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, and as you said. Um, and when we went through fatal crashes, we can see that nine out of 10 would be uh, saved by just doing some infrastructure uh, changes and uh, vehicle technology and if uh, the cyclist was wearing a helmet. So of course, that's uh, the most important parts, but uh, we are just trying in this um, pre-study to gain knowledge how we can actually, because uh, also, we have conducted a study looking at um, injured cyclists, and then we can see that it's more or less the same situations. And uh, a cyclist um, that are doing cycling for uh, training or uh, going um, between two um, places will, will not, uh, of course, uh, use the roads that are the most uh, dense. And uh, we could see that um, most of these occurred with uh, very low uh, traffic. And of course, these are not the roads that will be implemented new uh, infrastructure. And um, of course, as you said, it's important to make it acceptable. And of course, uh, that's uh, something we have uh, in our team. We've got uh, people working with design. Uh, if you design it and if you could uh, fit it on uh, on products that are you are actually using like a, a backpacker or whatever, then you perhaps can add some more functions into to the project uh, product and also make uh, the cyclist uh, uh, to use them. I think you have a good point there. Thank you. Are you uh, happy there, Johanna? If, if so, we um, we hand over to Peter. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Helena. It's uh, interesting, really interesting to see uh, the work that you have been doing. Um, I, I, I would really re-emphasize what I think uh, you're focusing on here with visibility. I think that in um, if you look at attentiveness uh, among drivers in particular, but attentiveness and visibility, that will be the, for me, uh, the two most important uh, preventive measures that we have to work with uh, in this uh, area. Uh, so I, I think this is excellent that you're studying that. And uh, I mentioned briefly before uh, that the accident research that Volvo do, does, uh, looking specifically into heavy vehicle crashes, uh, show the same story that you are alluding to here. Uh, the fact that a lot of these crashes occur in daytime, um, good weather as well. 
uh, it's interesting uh, that we have that uh, situation. Uh, you're looking into a similar, I think, scenario or type crash that Marco would, was studying with the longitudinal uh, rear-ending approach. Um, and um, but I, I think uh, your results are very much generic, right? I think your um, the fact that you're focusing so much on conspicuity or visibility uh, would be uh, at least if you, we look at our, uh, at the research uh, data that we have and the type crashes that involve uh, unprotected road users the the kind of this the thing that emerges if you break it down is that it's very much about visibility in all of these crashes or the lack of visibility in many cases so um i i, I think that is excellent and and if you then approach that, I suppose, by by using textiles, or if you you work with maybe lights uh, on the bikes, also during daytime. Uh, I'm a strong believer in using lights in for every road user, both day and night. I think it increases detectability a lot. In fact, uh, so I, I do not uh, like very much the the new uh, normal that we have on, on the road with um, daytime running lights and. Uh, rear lights uh, being turned off and all that. Uh, I think that's uh, that's a hazard in itself. Uh, but as I mean, as I have to speak as a manufacturer, of course, and a manufacturer of heavy vehicles uh, at that. So we, we have to look at like a holistic strategy for addressing vulnerable road user crashes, uh, which means that we clearly have to work with the visibility aspect. So both direct and indirect visibility from the vehicle and uh, creating also the best possible uh, interaction designs that we have so that we can maximize attentiveness among drivers then so that they actually do see and detect the, the cyclists. Uh, and when that fails, or if that fails, the driver support systems that Marco also investigated before needs to be uh, our last resort and, and uh, do the uh, necessary alerting and braking possibly to avoid a collision. But what I think would be really, really interesting uh, would uh, be further studies, I suppose, then into how uh, new types of, of smart textiles or me maybe metallic materials in clues uh, or on helmets and on the bike itself, I guess, uh, could aid our detection systems uh, and by, by making them more visible in, in the eyes of the radar or of the camera, not just the driver, I mean. Uh, that area, I think, is untapped at this point. It would be very interesting to see how we can make our sensors more effective. Um, but, but thank you very much, Helena. It's very interesting to see your studies. I totally agree. Uh, it's uh, very important that we do have um, uh, using uh, the material that will uh, be also the sensor will be um, uh, like uh, improving the visibility for the sensors uh, and that's something that we uh, are going to uh, add into the project so that's actually something that we have already thought about and um, and of course it's um, we will have a workshop and we will invite uh, some of you just to uh, our knowledge to the areas that we are that we are not uh, uh, expert on. Thank you. We do have some questions as well. I, I will, I'll uh, pick one uh, here from Per Schilander. Um, so when people, when when the car drivers or vehicle drivers say that they didn't actually see the bike or the, the cyclists, uh, how how truthful is that? Can, do we have any kind of judgment on this uh, on sort of this uh, these statements? Uh, that's based on um, fatal crashes, and then it's um, police reports and uh, all the ones that are working for the Swedish Transport Administration doing uh, the inspection. So, of course, um, um, when you are hitting a cyclist and you haven't brake at all, or if you have been doing something else that you know um, with a system inside, uh, the vehicle. Actually, we are doing a project right now at Forksam and Bionier looking at um, how the driver is uh, actually um, looking during uh, driving. And of course, uh, sometimes you are 
uh, far away from uh, looking at um, at the road. And um, going back to um, Marco's uh, presentation, we could see that 19 occurred during uh, overtaking. And of course, in these situations, it's more or less that they uh, something uh, unexpected happened and then they will hit uh, the cyclist. But in many cases, it actually, they didn't see it and they are just uh, bumping into the cyclist. Thank you, and, and uh, uh, I'll take the opportunity also to, to mention that there is um, a conference that is normally held every second year called DDI, which focuses on driver um, inattention, so where some of these questions are, are very much um, addressed. It should have been um, last month, uh, October, um, in Lyon. It has been postponed until next year, so that's one of the one of the sources where we, we can see also what's going on in the in the in the the research field in general, um, I'd like to pick up on another question that came a bit earlier before the break, actually from Paul, uh, Paul Hemmeren uh, at Skövde, and you also mentioned Paul's research, yep. um, Helena. Maybe Paul, you want to to uh, ask your question yourself um, regarding the infrastructure aspects and so on. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> very, very good presentations. Um, and they generate a lot of good uh, thoughts and, and comments about um, what's happening. Um, so I think one of the critical questions here is how does the level of complexity, traffic complexity, reflect um, the interaction between uh, drivers and vulnerable road users. So it's this interaction that we want to uh, understand in order to uh, provide better protection for vulnerable road users. Um, and how can we increase the um, uh, predictive attention or predictive vision of drivers when it comes to uh, understanding the intentions of vulnerable road users? Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, if you want to start, <laughs> Selena, I think there are others that might like to come comment on this one as well because it it, it addresses both your uh, and Katya's and Marcos uh, presentations in a sense. For us uh, in our pre study, we are focused on uh, rare, uh, on rural roads because um, in uh, cities you are more aware that it's going to be a cyclist uh, on the road. Uh, and more of uh, the situations that uh, you actually think that it will be um, situations that um, you have to be aware of a cyclist. In many of the fatal crashes, um, um, the speed is uh, one of the issues. And of mm. course, uh, if on road roads you have a higher um, uh, difference between uh, the relative uh, um, velocity. And that's a big uh, issue, and and also uh, when it comes to that's Marco and probably some other. I saw that um, um, some other attendants uh, are better on uh, answer this. But uh, when it comes to uh, vehicle technology, it's really uh, tough for approaching um, a cyclist. Uh, that are cycling along the road because it's um, it's a, such a small duration, and uh, and then you will not be able to have an auto uh, braking system that will act. Uh, you will more uh, steer uh, the vehicle away from the cyclist. So that's uh, a tricky part, and and then um, uh, you will be using other uh, warning or um, steering. Oh, very good, thank you, Elena. Thank you. I'm not sure if you want to comment anything on this as well, uh, Katja. Mm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. I'm just giving you the opportunity. <laughs> um, well, I refrain at the moment. Yep. Thanks. That's fine. Problem. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, again, we, we do see some uh, comments uh, being written in, in the chat, so we will uh, take care of, of, of them. So thank you very much, um, Helena, for, for that presentation and, and uh, the others for the discussion afterwards as well. So uh, by that, I will hand over to, um, uh, to Magnus and uh, let me see if I also yes. can move to the right slide. Please, Magnus. Yes, I would like to uh, introduce my colleague Frederik Bruselius, who is a docent in vehicle dynamics at VTI and Chalmers University. And he's going to talk a little bit about the dynamics of bicycles, because that is something that we have to understand in the sense of why, why sometimes people say it's, an, it's a lack of balance when you fall. So uh, please, Frederik, tell us a little bit about the dynamics and, of course, about our our own cycle simulator that we have in Gothenburg. The floor is yours. Thank you, Magnus. I think you need to stop sharing for me to, to thank you. Can you see my presentation now? Yes. yes. OK, thank you. Uh, yes, just as Magnus said, my name is Fredrik Priselius. I work at BTI. I will uh, go a little bit against the grain here uh, with my presentation and focus on the bicycle as itself, uh, and also with a vehicle dynamics perspective. But first, some words about myself. Um, I have, uh, I was born in Värmland, Kristinehamn, uh, made my basic training in, in uh, Karlstad and Linköping universities, my PhD and docent at Chalmers, uh, where the focus now is in vehicle dynamics. <clears throat> As all people in the Gothenburg region, I have a history uh, at Volvo uh, for some years before I started at VTI, the Swedish National Road and Transport Research Institute. And there I work with vehicle systems and driving simulation. And uh, as of 2014, I'm also an adjunct person at Chalmers, helping out with supervision of PhD students. <clears throat> I thought that since vehicle dynamics is a little bit of an odd word in this context, it's not vehicle dynamics doesn't necessarily connect to safety, doesn't necessarily connect to bikes. So I thought that perhaps it's it's good to present what what is vehicle dynamics, what kind of aspects do we study and so on. And I will go into what, how we can apply this to bicycles. I must say, I have not studied bicycles that much. Uh, bicycles are not my main vehicle of study. Uh, the main reason for that is funding, the money flow in other directions, as you all know. Um, and then I will try to argue that vehicle dynamics is useful really in, in, the, in the traffic safety context, just as Magnus suggested in the beginning. Uh, and I will present a tool that we have developed at VTI to study this from a vehicle dynamics perspective. So if we start with uh, vehicle dynamics, uh, it's an academic um, topic. It's, as the name suggests, the study of vehicles and vehicles in particular, uh, uh, ground vehicles and most often uh, road vehicles so that includes trucks buses cars but also two wheelers or three wheelers if you if you like that as well um it's a more of a deductive research field where we have an axiomatic axiomatic framework uh, that we take from uh, classical mechanics control engineering tribology mathematics and so on to deduce the research which i guess it's a little bit different than from we were heard before. Uh, in my field, there is a smaller branch which, which do uh, field measurements and statistics as well, but it's much smaller. And also, we, we typically don't include the driver or rider in our topic. So we focus on, on the vehicle or the car, the bus, the truck itself in isolation and how it reacts on the response. But we don't, we try to, uh, to isolate the, the vehicle. And in particular, uh, the, the kind of decisions that we've seen in the previous um, 
you, the driver make uh, high level decisions on path and so on. So if we think of uh, the motion of bicycles, um, we can think of what, what, what is particular for a bicycle uh, in terms of motion. And the, the first thing to observe is it's propelled by the rider. This is almost the definition from Transport Styrelsen. If it's not propelled by the driver, it becomes something else. Um, usually it's a two-wheeler where the wheels are aligned in the travel direction. And that implies that you need to lean to account for the centripetal acceleration and also that you need to balance. Uh, these are very important aspects from a vehicle dynamics perspective. <clears throat> and also that we have touched upon in the previous uh, presentations today, also the, the weight ratio. If you take the weight of the bike rider, then he, is, he or she constitutes on, uh, of the um, uh, combination up to 80-90%, depending on your weight configuration and the bike, of course. And the, similar, uh, uh, and the corresponding number for a car is a few percent, and for a truck is obviously even lower. So the, the, the mass of the rider is really, really uh, substantial in, in, uh, in a bicycle. So that needs to be considered. So if we just try to make some examples or see some examples on what kind of things we study on bikes in terms of vehicle dynamics, um, this is just an some uh, fields like um, wobble and weave. If you've been to the supermarket and you picked up the bad trolley with a wobbly wheel, you have seen that effect and that can also occur on bikes, which is dangerous. It's easy, so it's important to understand why that happens. In general, tire dynamics for cars and trucks and buses, tires are very important. Uh, they determine they are the interface to the to the um, to the ground, uh, and they are the only basically the only um, uh, source of forces. So if you lose uh, if you lose the grip, you you know what happens. And if you if you take into account also that you only have two wheels, it becomes even uh, more critical. Brake performance, we have two phenomena that are quite common on bikes. You can, uh, you can uh, uh, brake too hard on the front wheel, so you fly over um, uh, the steering wheel, the handlebar. And also if you uh, lock up the front wheel, you know that you lose the ability to steer. And the ability to steer is one of the, the most important mechanism for keeping the balance. If you can't steer into the fall, you cannot move your contact in the ground to compensate the, the lean, and you will fall almost immediately. And we can see that all these things, or most of these things, include the rider in the analysis. So it's kind of inherited in the problem that we need to take care of the rider. Still, we don't care really about the high-level decisions, but more on a on a close uh, on a short time scale. So, if if we look at why we should deal with with vehicle dynamics from um, traffic safety and and uh, so on um, perspective, uh, we can say that we can design good car, uh, good uh, bicycles. We can even define what good is, of course, uh, in terms of, of vehicle dynamics. Uh, but I think it's a little bit of a misconception that vehicle dynamics is a topic that only deals with uh, designing vehicles and it's a, a topic for the vehicle manufacturer. I think it can be used much broader. And for example, we can set requirements on equipment. And one obvious thing is the tires we have 
legislations and, and uh, constraints on, on uh, car and truck tires. We could think of um, similar uh, requirements for, uh, for um, bike tires, for example, that could be investigated if it makes sense to have uh, proper equipment. Also, we can use in certain aspects, put requirement on, on road standards. Uh, Katja showed a very, very um, slushy uh, bike lane. Uh, I think we can, we, with the vehicle dynamics, determine if it's dangerous or not. Uh, if we include the, <coughs> the rider and the response, the fast response, we can determine uh, the dangerousness of, of potholes. Uh, we can determine required geometry for speeds, etc. So we can we can uh, help out that. And, and if we look at it in a more general sense, we can basically study anything that is happening fast and is where the bike dynamics is essential. And I think that is uh, more. Um, there are more topics, this, and we can see also that we uh, in in these um, uh, areas we we uh, we include the the we need to include the rider as well. So that's why we uh, came to the conclusion that uh, build a bicycle simulator at VTI. Uh, VTI has a strong and long history of using driving simulators, and they're a quite good tool to, to study the interaction between the vehicle and the driver or rider. Not only from this high level decision making, but also from a vehicle dynamics and, and shorter time range. So the main idea we had was to utilize our existing infrastructure and particularly the, the SIM4 driving simulator in Gothenburg. That's a hexapod on top of the, the linear sled in two dimensions. And it has a dome that you see on, on the picture there uh, where we can place uh, a car or a truck cabin, and the idea was to, to uh, develop a bike cabin, so to say, to, to be uh, interchanged with. And the focus was, of course, on dynamics, since it was driven by, by dynamics people. And uh, since then, uh, since, uh, since it's dynamics, we want to use the motion platform extensively for this purpose. And if we if we if we um, think of what, what kind of um, interactions you have or interfaces you have with the bicycle as a from a vehicle dynamics perspective, you have obviously the handlebar, uh, which determines your your uh, your heading basically, and uh, such I've shown that the torque feedback is really really important to to show to the driver, so we need to be able to to create the, the handlebar torque and also measure the angle. Also the pedal resistance and speed of, of the, to simulate the, the speed of the uh, bike for obvious reasons. But the third one might be a little bit less important if you don't, if you don't bike a lot or if you don't think about it. But your, uh, your uh, posture or way of, of um, Moving your your um, center of gravity uh, is quite important uh, when it comes to balance and also steering. Uh, there are basically two ways to steer um, when we initiate uh, a to take a curve. You could either steer in the wrong direction to make to get an angle and then steer back and sit, uh, sit uh, straight, or you can lean a little bit to get an initial uh, leaning direction. So th this is quite important as well, and it feels very weird if you don't have this. 
So the first attempt we did was to simulate uh, straight, uh, straight riding and to simulate the balancing act, which is kind of important for bikes, of course. Um, to the left, you see the, the bike simulator uh, inside the Doom with a, with, a, um, with a screen in front. And uh, there is a degree of freedom in the floor. So the, the, the red bike can lean towards the, the floor. Uh, and the idea was to let the rider balance against this simulator floor. Uh, with its roll angle by moving by moving the platform sideways as it steers to the fall just as you do in a in a real uh, on a real bike uh, so uh, you can say that we managed to do this there's my colleague uh, balancing um, and it's there's the simulator moving a little bit sideways. And um, he managed to do it. I didn't. It turns out that the latencies that we have, the delays we have in our visual system is far too uh, high to be compensated for. This was, of course, hard. We know we were aware of our latencies in the system before we did the 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 um, the, the, the test. But it's hard to to predict what what kind of um, how how much you can compensate for as a human being. Friedrich, Friedrich, yep. two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, the latencies in in the steering angle to platform displacement made it um, also very challenging. Um, oh. Oh, there. Last slide. Uh, the current status, uh, we have fixed the roll degree of freedom now, uh, which means that we have lost one very important degree of freedom from a vehicle dynamics perspective, but we can and do uh, have certain um, immersion of, of balance in the graphics. Um, which is, I would say, good enough for studies where where the where the um, uh, bicycle dynamics is of less importance. Um, Marco said that we were going to use this in Mika 2, for example. Next steps from a vehicle dynamics perspective is we wanted to study motion queuing, the perception of motion using the motion platform more extensively, and also we want to work on our latencies. And that's. Well, thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, very interesting. And I th see that we this is a, a super seminar, of course, since we are arranging it. And I would like to get Peter. What is your feedback on this as a producer of vehicles? <laughs> yeah, uh, that was really uh, interesting, uh, Frederick. I, I, uh, I can imagine that was a really tough challenge to to get to this point. Uh, I can imagine those control algorithms are are really really uh, interesting to look at. I would love to do that at some point. Um, I, I think obviously for, for when it comes to simulations in general, I think we have a great um, um, need for that uh, in our industry. We we're moving, of course, from roads to simulators and and into the digital uh, domain more and more. Uh, it's more and more critical that we we can do that. Um, so I think for sure uh, this type of, of uh, tools, I suppose, would be uh, really interesting to see what that can can um, help us uh, accomplish. Uh, I don't necessarily know exactly what that would be at this point, but I think this is um, it, it seems that we can create now a lot of new type of, of uh, situations. Uh, possibly we can bring back some of the question we had earlier in this seminar where we looked at uh, the um, 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 I like, for instance, air drag uh, in overtaking by by large vehicles. Maybe that is something that we can simulate now uh, with with the help of your um, bicycle simulator. That would be quite uh, for sure very interesting to see how that influences driving. Um, but I, in in general, I think that this type of things uh, is um, 
clearly benefiting the wider understanding of this whole field of safety. So uh, good job for you. And now I would like to give uh, more space uh, to um, to Johanna, who I think have a lot more to to kind of get out of this uh, as well. So um, I hand okay. it over to Johanna. Thank you, Thank Peter. You. Yeah. I would just uh, give you an, a small in, introdu introduction there. Johanna said that the bike, the world's best invention, has pretty much looked the same for at least 100 years plus. So what is your reflections, Johanna? Yeah, I would say more, and le more or less yes. But uh, since the e-bike uh, came into the market, I think that we are now facing uh, so and seeing something new here when we can connect the bike and <coughs> it gives a new dimension to this vehicle as well, I think. But you you, you are right, you have right there. Since uh, beginning of the 1900th century, I think it was more or less the same, but now it, we are entering a new world, I think. And to comment on, on your work, uh, Frederick, this is of course really interesting for us, as you understand. And I agree with you that there is a complexity that the mass of the cyclist needs to be taken into consideration when developing bikes that behave in a safe way. And I'm sure that the simulator can be used to evaluate the new standards for certain parts and equipments, as you mentioned as well. So very good. I, I need to be honest and, and say that, and I'm embarrassed a little bit that I didn't know about this bike simulator until I read your work, Frederick. Um, and I think also that this opens up new possibilities for us in the bike development. And um, since I have already shared this with my colleagues in Barberg, we have a team that is very eager to learn more about this and to understand how this can help us to fulfill our mission to developing the safest bikes in the market. So if we can yeah. assist you in further development of the simulator, we are more than happy to set up a meeting to discuss that with you, Frederick. Thank you. That's interesting. <clears throat> Very good. Yeah. You want you want to widen your reply, Frederick, to, to uh, uh, Peter and Johanna? Yeah, I, I think the the overtaking. We we have actually done similar things for cars in the simulator, so I think it wouldn't be uh, that much of an effort to at least approach the problem with uh, aerodynamic um, influences when you overtake um, on a bike. So sure, that that's that's an interesting topic. I and and I agree. I I think it's it, it's uh, it's in very important um, a useful tool both from a vehicle dynamics perspective but also from for uh, more human factors human factors research oriented questions as it's a tool that you can isolate perfectly uh, events and you can control the environment almost uh, ideally so i think it's it's um, it's a useful tool for many people Good. Uh, is there any questions from the audience that you would like to address? So, or is one of our uh, one of our, one of the experts in our audience maybe would like to give a question to Frederick so he can widen his answer a little bit? Is anyone having anyone? Is there any is, Frederick? Is there a lot of uh, uh, is there time left for the simulator? Is it possible to come with a study right now? Uh, no, but that's due to <laughs> COVID. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, I now we uh, now with the new restrictions we have problems uh, conducting uh, experiments with test persons for obvious reasons. Uh, before the new restriction, we, we we do have procedures to take care of it, but now with the new restriction, I I I think it will be hard. But uh, apart from that, of course, yes, it's 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 there. It's supposed to be um, a resource to be used. So uh, everyone is welcome to come talk to us for projects and. Etc. And, and from your perspective, what kind of research would you see that has to be done as a, as a as a platform? 
since this is, has not been done so much in in that field that you talk about now. No, I I, I think we the the development of the of I mean it's a constant development of the of the platform and the and the simulator, but um, I think we we will have some validation studies. I think Mika Mika two will be part of. Uh, will be part of the Mika 2 to do validation tests so we can confirm that the rider response is uh, representative of, of what you would do on a, on a real bike. So I think that's um, that is one thing. Mm. Uh, we got a question now at, in the chat. Is there any problems with, with simulator sickness for bike riders? Yes, of course. It is always, ah. yeah, 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 of course. How do you uh, cure that? The pill? Uh, yeah, if 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 someone had the straight answer to that, then <laughs> then uh, we would have solved a lot of things. I I, I mean, it's uh, simulator sickness is is mainly due to mismatch between uh, different cues and expectations of different cues. So uh, working in that direction. And the, this balancing, for example, is is one of those. Yeah. yeah. Another question is: there is there any possibility to simulate the interaction between cars and bicycles interacting at an intersection? I mean, both the car and the bicycle. I know the answer of this one, but you have to reply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yes, yes, and no. I mean, in, in driving simulators, you want to keep an environment that is. <laughs> Old. And if you in, if you introduce an, another uh, non-deterministic actor, a, yeah. a car driver, then you will have difficulty controlling the conditions. So that is that's that's the that's the negative response. But sure, it's doable, and it's a very it's a great challenge to to get to the to the um, to the point you want with, with to. Um, two persons in the simulations. Okay. Anyone else for a question? Maybe Magnus has a question. He usually has uh, thought a lot of things. Do you have a... Yes, Magnus Granström here. Uh, um, just a curiosity question, Fredrik. Uh, uh, how many of, the, of these uh, simulators uh, do exist around the world? Do you know? And, and uh, how well does your one match up? No one have had the, the crazy idea of putting a bicycle on top of <laughs> complex uh, and expensive okay. motion platform so that's for sure um there there, uh, there are different types of, of simulators and the different types uh people use treadmills as well to study which i guess is is from a certain aspect more accurate um uh, and there there are a few uh bicycle simulators um that have a some sort of ability to 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 uh, to activate motion um, on on a hexapod typically, but I guess the most advanced ones are for motorcycles because the motorcycle industry I guess is stronger. Um, yeah, so we're we're a little bit unique with with the, with the combination. Unique is a, is a good uh, word to, to to say thank you very much, Friedrich, for your presentation. And uh, I think this is uh, the whole meaning about this webinar is just to put these these uh, field areas together. And uh, we have a unique uh, setting here now in this webinar so that we can prolong the questions and see how we can go further on. And by that, I. I I introduce uh, not only myself, but my colleague, Magnus Granström. What is our conclusion today? <laughs> yes, I've tried to make some notes during the, the webinar as well. So first of all, I would like to point out that this is very much a first um, first step in this uh, in getting these kinds of new collaborations up and running and, and so on. So uh, please um, provide your feedback later on and you will have a chance to do it via the Menti and, and you will have, have the uh, possibility through uh, uh, contacting us via email and so on as well. So some things that I noted down, and please Magnus uh, just um, comment and add as well. Uh, one thing that 
several of them have been discussing yeah, that's the the speed aspect and, and sort of okay we are moving at different speeds um, and maybe the different speeds in one sense is more important than the the type of vehicle from certain aspects and and i think one thing to look into also is now we see that many cities around and not least in europe um, introduced the 30 kilometers per hour limit in in the um, as a big rollout and um, how do we um, how do we view that how how, um, how will that affect the different um, sort of injuries that we get and the way the people move and so on and of course connected to that is the the shared space and there's been some discussion also in the um, in the chat regarding uh, different types of roads and how do you make sure that you get enough space for the for the vehicles and so on. So I think the shared space aspect is one of those um, major things as well. Um, I also noted um, that, for instance, the Mika project shows how you can use already existing technology, but sometimes maybe in 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 a new way to get um, to get additional. Um, safety and so on. So that is also interesting to look into. Do we have other types of already existing technologies or methodologies or whatever it might be that that we could also benefit from? And I think also moving towards more and more uh, automated vehicles and so on that we we will see on our roads and we start to see some of them. Uh, the infrastructure aspect, um, the visibility aspects, uh, except has been mentioned also a number of times uh, and I think this goes very very much along with the same kind of discussion when it comes to usage of helmets and and, and sort of how do we if even though we we may uh, be able to to get very good um, protective clothing and so on how do we make sure that they are these are being used um, we have been touching on the subject of sort of making sure that we definitely get also the cyclists aspect into uh, the different kinds of research projects that where the projects with themselves might be primarily focused on other types of vehicles it's it's um, very important that we get sort of the the uh, the cyclists view and 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 needs and so on into and that also takes me on to the next one which is really the the matter of how how do we make sure that we can fund this kind of research how do we as uh, we see that we can do this from a national perspective in the, in the programs what, that we do have here in Sweden. Um, sometimes they are a bit limited in the, in the sense that you have to have a fairly large amount of industrial in kind or contributions of different different kinds and that might be difficult from a, from a cyclist perspective. So I think that is important to, to bring in and not least um, as we started with, and and, and Johanna also pointed out um, somewhere in the middle of the meeting as well, the the um, the possibility through these um, the funds that are now available on a European level uh, from the recovery and resilience funds, uh, where I think as both as countries but also as cities, it's possible to uh, to uh, propose, um, design, and apply for funding to um, to really do some concrete. Uh, changes. So those were some of my uh, my main uh, takeaways. Uh, Magnus, anything you would like to um, to it add? Was, it was a super conclusion there, Magnus, and I have just want to add the, the platform that we're now addressing the, the the both vehicles at the same time, the car and the cycle, the cycle and the road users, the car driver and the cyclist. And I think we have a, a unique possibility here to launch some really good research, which is going to make cycling more and safer. And um, and I also would like to give my colleague Anna Niska a, a quick uh, minute to launch a commercial for another webinar, please, if you're there, Anna. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity also to thank you all for organizing a really nice webinar. But uh, I would like to announce another webinar that is arranged uh, by Cykelcentrum and Lund University together with the steering committee of the International Cycling Safety Conference that was planned to be uh, <laughs> launched in um, in Lund these two days, but uh, instead we have a short webinar due to COVID-19. The, the conference itself has been postponed to next year.
but tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, you can join this webinar and I put a link on the chat so you can register if you have not done that already. And the focus will be on, on um, single bicycle crashes. So that's an, uh, from a safety perspective, a very important issue when it comes to cycling safety. So please join us tomorrow. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. So then we are sort of rounding it up, Magnus. Yes, we are definitely doing that and it's very, coming very, very close to lunch. So again, I would like to say thank you to all our presenters, to our experts and to you in the audience who've um, been com contributing in, in different ways through questions, through chats and, and so on. And as we've said a number of times, don't hesitate to contact us. This is uh, we are in, in the creation phase here, so uh, we are shaping this this um, collaboration and this platform, as Magnus is saying. So we put up another Menti. Um, we will keep this open for a while. So uh, just please provide your, your input there if you like. And um, again, if, if you would like to provide it in any other way, please, please do so. And um, I think by that I would like to, um, to close the webinar and um, that you all have got something new, um, something to think about, uh, some ideas, uh, some thoughts uh, and things that you've learned um, during this, these two and a half hours. And um, we will May, continue maybe, this work. And maybe also connected to some new friends that you didn't know that you were having the same, same interesting goals with your research or interest in, in getting things done. Yes. Absolutely, thank you. And and also, if you if you know of other people who who should have been interested and uh, and so on, please um, please let them know that this has been uh, running today. We will put up uh, um, the information on uh, our respective web web pages and so on, so it will all be uh, accessible afterwards. So please, we will send up send out that uh, that information so um, so we can pass it on also to those who you think might be interested. So by that, I will uh, say uh, thank you on behalf of all the uh, organizers and um, have a good day and uh, stay safe. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.